Hi everybody, welcome back to the studio. Hope you enjoyed uh, the last episode on Antoine, where we did a lot of structural work, putting him back together, repairing that tear. Um, thanks for all the comments that everyone uh, got in touch with. It was great to read through those. And yeah, there is a little bit of a mystery around who the artist may be and who the sitter may be, but we will delve into that a little bit later on. Um, today, we're gonna focus on cleaning the paintings. So we'll be removing the varnish. And then once we've removed the varnish, we'll start looking at filling and um, retouching the painting in. So um, yeah, let's get back to it. The first thing I do is to check the paint surface. Um, so I've got a number of different cleaning solutions and I'll start with a fairly weak solution just to see what we'll remove from the surface. So this will test for any smoke damage, any nicotine or tar staining. And then you can see straight away there that it's a very kind of amber brown color that's removed. So that would suggest that there is some, some smoke damage on there. And then what I'll do is I'll test that in another pigment area just to see that what I remove is the same colour and tone and I'm not removing any pigment as well. So same solution and it looks like I'm getting the same kind of amber brown um, colour on my swab. So that tells me that that solution is fine for an overall clean. But what I want to do is see if there is a varnish that will remove. So then I use a, a stronger solvent solution. And then on the same test window, I allow the solution to um, work its magic, shall we say, and dissolve that varnish and then see if we can get down to the original paint layer. And then straight away there you can see the brightness coming through there. So we've got a very, we've got two different layers on this painting. We've got a smoky, discolored, dirty, layer and then that is on top of a very discolored probably damar varnish so you can see there that that solvent is removing that quite nicely and again as with the previous test i'll use the same solvent and i'll make sure that my solvent clean again doesn't remove any pigment from that paint surface during the cleaning process so a very small amount of solvent on there and I'll just work that to make sure that I'm biting through to the varnish. So you can see my test window is circular and I'm going across two different pigment ranges. I've got the red on one half and then the dark kind of um, color from his cravat. And that way I can just test both things at once and make sure that the color is consistent, which it is. And before I start my clean, I'll put the painting under UV light and look for some retouchings and I can see that there are quite a few areas that are showing up darker and these suggest that the painting has been retouched, that's a very dark area in his shoulder. Um, so as I begin cleaning I'll be aware of any areas that have come up under UV and um, just be wary that if any pigments do come off I know that it's past retouchings. So now that I've got my uh, top coat cleaning solution prepared, I've got a fairly large swab and I'm just gonna do a surface clean on this painting now. And the results at this stage won't be too dramatic, but if you just keep your eye on the swab, you'll see the amount of dirt and smoke that I can remove from there. And it is quite laden on this painting. But at this stage, we won't be going through the varnish layer. We'll just be removing that top layer of dirt and smoke. So I tried to get a nice flat swab, like a quite a large area so that the solution as that I'm cleaning, you can compress the swab and it sucks in the dirt to the central core of the swab. You can see there it is extremely dirty in parts. Hi right, guys, just thought I'd interrupt you there with a public service announcement. Our latest batch of Bloomfield Arts handmade in the UK aprons are now available on the web shop. I've got limited numbers of these available. Um, nice deep pockets for loitering in style. Uh, pencils, pens, rulers, top pocket. Nice deep pocket for your phone. Um, if you want to support the channel, if you want to look good while you're doing something around the house, painting, gardening, a bit of art restoration, why not get yourself one of these highly stylish aprons? Um, I'll put a link up here or here somewhere. Um, but yeah, check them out guys and uh, let me know what you think. 
Oh, forgot to say, two colours available. This is the um, Executive Restorer apron for special occasions. So if you want to get your hands on this one, same great pockets, same handmade in the UK, um, go and check it out. Okay guys, let's get back to it. So his face does look a little bit brighter already. You can see that he's getting cleaner. And once I've cleaned that whole area, the whole surface area, then I'll start moving on to a solvent swab. So this is a, a mixture of a number of different solvents that's designed to just penetrate that varnish layer and leave the pigment layer intact. So you can see again, I'm getting a nice amber tone there, which would suggest a Damar varnish. And then straight away, you can see the brightness of the cravat coming through. If you've been watching the channel for long enough, you'll know that I always start with the white pigments, the, uh, the, the strongest pigments on a painting, the zincs and the titaniums and the flake and lead white. So my solution, if it is quite where it needs to be, I know that it's safe to start on these areas and then I can adjust as I go along. I can weaken it over the browner tones or if there's a green tones in there that are weak as well, I can adjust my solution accordingly. But straight away you can see the colour of that cravat coming through and some of the detail of the lace work. Um, yeah, it's a really positive start to the clean. There are a few elements there of um, past restorations that have removed slightly. You can see slightly brown tones in the detail there. So that's something that will need to be put back later on. And again, I'm going to use the same solution on his sash and just monitor that swab to make sure there's no red pigments or deeper pigments appearing. So the difference that I've found already with the cravat, it's very exciting at this point just to see what colours will reveal on his face. So. With the solution, I like to apply it in certain areas and then let it soften and then just keep moving that around. But straight away, that, that varnish layer is beginning to erode or melt, for want of a better word, and you'll start to see the colours coming through. So again, the forehead has got a lot of white pigments in there, so we'll start on there. I'm always wary around eyebrows and pupils and eyes because there's lots of usually brown tones in there. Um, and these can remove if you're not too careful. And I find eyes are always very lightly painted. Artists tend to be very delicate around eyes, uh, trying to get the look just right. Whereas, like I said, in the forehead and the cheeks, they're a bit more liberal and they apply the paint thicker in these areas. And I suppose it gives a little bit of relief to the painting as well. And it allows a little bit of depth in those eye sockets and around the mouth. So. Mouths, eyes and eyebrows, always very careful. Um, foreheads and cheeks, you can be a little bit more um, vigorous, shall we say. But straight away, you, you can see the difference now. You can see the quality of that painting begin to shine through. So whoever did paint this face was very, very talented and knew what they were doing. So as I'm getting through to the paint surface now, I'm just using my loom just to magnify what's going on. And there are a couple of areas of overpaint there. Those horizontal dark lines are historical overpaint. So this painting has been cleaned in the past. It has had restoration work done on it, which to be fair for a painting that's over 300 years old is to be expected. But as I'm cleaning, this varnish solution uh, that I'm using to remove the varnish is not touching that overpaint. So that's just something for me to be aware of further down the line. Um, and if I can't use a stronger solution, I may well look at retouching those back in. So I've lightly gone over that left eye. I'm starting to move around to the right side of the face now. Um, there's highlights on his nose, but there's also um, retouching work that's coming through. 
his mouth, the, the, the red of his lips is, is quite strong. Sometimes that can be a bit of a weak pigment, but that looks fairly good condition. And he's got this little kind of moustache thing going on as well, so I want to be wary that I don't remove any of that during the clean process. Here's me a little bit further down the line. The sash has half been cleaned and you can see the other half is still dirty, but the colours that are coming through are so bright and so vibrant in that sash and the gold braiding to um, the clothing that he's got on as well. Here you can see those kind of orangey brown overpaint areas. There's horizontal and vertical lines, but his eyes are, are beautiful and intact, which is, which is quite unusual for a paint in this age. And then you can see that a detail on his moustache as well. Now, when this shoulder was put under UV, there are large areas of overpaint appeared. So looking at the crackler in there, I think this area has been heavily cleaned in the past. I'm expecting swathes of green pigment to come off um, and darker pigments as well in those shadows. Um, I'm just going to check through with the loom. So you can see the crackler is quite heavy and there's some lighter green tones that are caught in the crack. So that's not original paint, that's over paint that's kind of been held in those recesses. So again, this just backs up my theory that there is over paint on there. The UV light has shown that. So as I'm cleaning, I'm going to be more confident that I'm removing historical retouchings rather than anything original. It's a shame though, because I imagine this element this drapery this clothing was a lot more refined when it was first painted so when it was cleaned in the past it could have been done 200 years ago 100 years ago i think a majority of that fine brushwork has been removed so you can see there that the, the varnish is very thick and sometimes when it's thick it grabs the cotton wool and it grabs the cotton so this is something that just, again, backs up my, my principles that it's a very thick Damar varnish on there. So you can see there, I'm gonna to have to rework that area just to remove that cotton. But yeah, these elements here, there's overpaint, there's washes that have been applied on top and glazes um, that are sitting in the recess of that crackler. I never really liked this stage of a clean. So the face, very confident, I'm happy. But even though I'm removing over paint, it's not an enjoyable feeling to see pigment coming off and, and revealing. So even though I know it's from past restorers, I never quite enjoy it because you're always second guessing yourself a little bit. But you can see that the, the ground layer is coming through and was always visible. And then the shadows have been reinforced. Well, I'm just being extra careful now around the tear. I've already had a few comments in why I haven't cleaned it flat before stretching, and I could well have done that. I could have cleaned it flat on um, on the board, but sometimes when you've got support behind, you are tempted to go a little bit heavier than you would from when it's stretched. So while it's stretched, you really get a sense of the tension and the fragility of a painting. So in this instance, I'm, I would prefer to clean it stretched just so that I can be a little bit more delicate in my approach. So with the shoulder clean now, I'm starting to work on the, the wig. And again, beautifully painted, beautiful brush strokes. There's so much detail in there. And just removing that varnish layer, you can see the curls and the amount of effort that's been put into that wig area. Sometimes the wigs can be a little bit disappointed that the brown pigment tones, which are the weakest, and you tend to see that these get over cleaned through time. But in this case, in very, very good condition, um, hardly any, if any, retouching in that area at all. And the same with the background, there are some damages to the background, which you'll see. Um, but again, the, whoever made these oil paints and ground the pigments and prepared the canvas knew what they were doing. It's a quality portrait and it's been executed very well. To get to this stage, I'm probably about three or four hours in. Um, my eyes will be beginning to get tired now, so it's probably time for a bit of a break and just assess where we're up to. So, um, you can see there that varnish is coming off him now and he, he looks fabulous. He He's so well painted, 
the skin tones are fabulous. The the wig, the, the curls, just everything about it is a delight. What a what a wonderful portrait. Um, there's some retouching on his face. You can see across his cheek, on his nose, but um, and a little bit on his shoulder. But um, he he looks fabulous. He's going to look amazing when he's finished. Um, so I'm just going to continue now with the background and take off more of that varnish. It's very sticky. It must be a very old Damar varnish that's on there. Um, but the colours that are revealing underneath it are just fantastic. So um, I'm going to uh, carry on now for the rest of the afternoon. So many, many swabs later, I've tackled probably, I don't know, 60% of the painting. Now you can see the area where the varnish is removed. You can see the area where I still have yet to tackle because it's still remaining quite glossy. So on his wig there, I've got a bit to do. On his eye, you can see where I've been a bit tentative. On his lips, around his cheek. So a raking light is really good for showing where you have cleaned and where you haven't and where you need to do more work. Um, so there's still quite a lot that requires doing before I can get to the next stage. Um, next stage will be barrier varnish, but there's probably a good few hours work left in there. And then this may well be um, that good few hours of work afterwards. So you can see the varnish has been removed from the full painting now and you can see lots of past restoration work. There's bits in the top corner there. There's one, two, three, four, five impacts on the top left. The largest being um, still patched on the rear of the canvas. So I didn't know that one was there. Some of the other ones look like scratches and dents that have been uh, retouched over time. So my barrier varnish is being applied now. This is fully reversible. Um, it's a hydrocarbon varnish. Uh, it's one that I mix myself. And I'm just gonna apply a coat of that now before I start any of the filling or the retouching. Another enjoyable part of the process is a bit of a milestone. Once you get to this stage, um, you've, you've taken off as much as you want to take off in terms of the clean you've revealed those colors. And then as you can see on his shoulder, parts of the painting sometimes oxidize with the cleaning process. So this varnish, this barrier varnish now will just saturate that whole paint surface and then really do start to see the, the colors coming through and you can see how the finished painting is going to look. So the background is, is there's a lovely depth to it. We've got that kind of feigned oval around there, which was quite popular at the time. Um, the way that sash has been approached is, is beautiful. If anyone's got any ideas of the, what the sash may be, um, please let me know. It looks like it could be a military honours. Now, I know the French had a blue sash. I'm not sure if this is a, a British or English sash that may signify something. Um, but again, with that varnish layer going on now, you can see the painting for, for, for what it is. That's quite an impressive wig. It is a really big full bottom wig that goes quite far over his shoulder and is quite high as well. But his face, just the, the way that face has been rendered is he's just present. You just feel him in the room. You can just feel his character. And I think that is a real trait of a, of a quality portrait rather than something that just looks generic or of its time. I can imagine this being a real person. So that's all the vertical strokes completed. And then as the varnish is curing, I, I like to go across ways as well and do the horizontal strokes. And this just makes sure that nothing is missed. Um, you'd be surprised how easy it is to miss a section. So full vertical, full horizontal strokes to give an even coverage. Yeah, fabulous, absolutely fabulous. The auction records suggest this could be painted by Simon Peters Verelst, a court painter predominantly known for still lives rather than portraits. He produced extremely realistic paintings of flowers with drops of dew on that amazed the viewer. He eventually went mad and called himself the god of flowers and king of painters. He did paint portraits though and was a famous one of Nell Gwynne who was King Charles's mistress and she became a chief patron of his. But I don't see similarities in style though with our portrait. So looking at what we have, the inscription on the canvas rear states Count Antoine Hamilton, 
and has the date of 1673. Underneath is the Lely inscription. However, when we search for Antoine Hamilton, we get up a rather different looking portrait. This portrait is in the National Gallery collection and his likeness is also in the engravings on the cover pages of different editions of his memoirs of the Duc de Grammont. Now, when I search for the Duc de Grammont, I get a portrait of his half-brother and then an engraving of Philibert de Grammont, who's our Duke, whom the memoirs are written about. The interesting thing is, though, that when you look at different editions of the book, different engravings take place for Count Hamilton and the Duke de Grammont. Some look like this portrait and others look like Philibert. Now, Lely we know as a prolific court painter and had a team of assistants. Lely would paint the face and then one of his assistants would paint the body or draperies or the background. He had a numbered system to produce stock poses so the assistants knew which pose was required. Lely's work was exceptionally high quality, but the work of his assistants could vary. He worked in a number of different formats and by 1671 he was charging £20 for a head, £30 for a half-length portrait and £60 for a full-length. In today's money, a full-length portrait would be around £25,000 or around $32,000. So, looking at some of his work now, I can see a certain stiffness in the bodies. The heads do look somewhat superimposed and I wonder if our portrait is also a stock pose painted by assistants with a lily head. Perhaps it was an unfinished portrait and the assistants quickly put the background in and signed it. I'm not too sure. From reading the memoirs of the Duke de Grammont and knowing that Lely was a court painter and painted the Duke's wife, Miss Hamilton, who was one of the Windsor beauties, I'm leaning towards that this portrait could well be of the Duke de Grammont himself. The engravings on the book certainly have a resemblance to him and I would have thought he may well have commissioned a portrait of himself. The Duke eventually returned to France when the King of France forgave him and no longer felt threatened by his presence in court now that he was married. Perhaps this portrait stayed behind with the Hamiltons or was bequeathed when he died. Maybe the inscription on the back was more of a mark of property to Count Antoine Hamilton rather than who the sitter was. I find it unusual that there is no portrait of him yet. He was such a prominent player in the court. As ever, this is all speculation and we may never know exactly who this is. This is just my feeling. Let me know in the comments what you think. What I've loved about this project has been the fact that I've got this book, The Memoirs of Count Grammont, and just reading, it's been heavy going, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, but just reading about the court of Charles II, it was a riot, God, what they got up to, uh, ladies in waiting and mistresses of the king and wives and lovers and all sorts of shenanigans, um, but it's been so nice to be able to read about this whole period and then look online and match the characters up to um, Lily's portraits and portraits of the time so it just brings the whole period to life which has just been incredible really I've, I've really enjoyed it and I'm sure there's a hell of a lot more I could be speaking about in terms of what the Count de Grammont got up to uh, some of the shenanigans that he that he did um, but he was just a real character and he was loved by all he had a real uh, charisma he was a gambler, he was always playing uh, cards to win money, that's how he funded his lifestyle. Um, he was just a real character and, and, I, and I would love this portrait to be of him as a young man. Um, but anyway, we'll see. There's, that's just my thoughts on the subject. Um, so as I've filled that damage now and we're doing my first pass retouching, and this shows me how good my fill is. Um, sometimes when you fill a painting, you um, you think you've, you've you've covered everywhere and and it's good. Um, but it's only when you actually start the retouching process that you may see that you've not quite matched the surface and matched the textures. So this is the first pass retouching. So I'll aim to get it as close as I can to the original. Um, but no doubt there will be a second pass after this just to tidy everything up. And again, if anywhere anything needs filling, like I can see up there on that top section, that needs a little bit more filling, that will be done once this has dried as well. So it's a bit of a two-stage process. Um, 
But again, if you've watched my channel for long enough, you'll know that I love retouching. It's one of my favorite elements of the job. And my early career, copying old master paintings to try and sell, put me in good stead for this. Um, so as I'm retouching, I try to build my color palette from the colors that are predominantly used in the painting. So in this case, there's lots of burnt umber, yellow ochre, uh, viridian hue for the green. There's a Prussian blue in there. And then to match the age of some of these colors, I'll be using um, raw umber and yellow ochre just to give some age to it as well. So sometimes I'll start with the darks leading into the into the lighter tones, sometimes it'll be the other way around. But again, probably first pass retouching on, on, on the main areas and then revisit once dried and check how everything is sitting. And then raking light is the restorer's worst enemy because it shows everything up. So that varnish, barrier varnish, has given a really nice uniform finish on there, which you can see. And then these large areas, these have got the old filler in. So the, the, the lighter brown is the old filler and then the white is my uh, more recent one. So again, it's going to take a couple of passes to push these all the way back. And these are some of the little past um, overpaint that removed on his cravat so there's two horizontal lines there um, and I'm just kind of gently pushing those back uh, not being too liberal with the paint but just enough so that from viewing distance that it looks whole again and you're not seeing that pale brown come through Again, with all my retouching, I try to do as little as possible, really. Just enough just to hide any damage or push anything back. But with this painting on the shoulder, we know there was large swathes of overpaint that had been added. Um, so to kind of remedy this, I'm applying a glaze. So I'm just glazing over that section just to kind of push it back and make the whole shoulder look uniform again. So I've got my barrier varnish on, so I'm not applying anything that can't be removed down the line should it need to be. But that ground layer that's coming through just needs pushing back to match how the original painting arrived, even though it had restoration work on. So you can see I've approached most of that bottom corner there now. You can still see my horizontal tear that's had first pass painting. And again, this is just another light glaze that's added to push that past damage back and then maintain that original shoulder, the, the green of the original painting. Um, <clears throat> such a shame though, because if you look at how the sash has been approached, it's got really crisp, there's plenty of paint on there, it's very strong. And then whatever happened in its past, that green area had just been completely overcleaned. So my role is just to kind of make that look a little bit more uniform and less distracting. So in most cases, I'll be retouching very minimally. Um, in this instance, though, I am applying glazes to make that area look uniform. This is more the level of retouching that I enjoy where it's just small, little precise dots. So I tried a number of solvents on this oil paint that had been applied. So I think this oil paint, this retouching that you can see that orangey tones has been on there a couple of maybe a hundred or so years. Um, and it's fused and hard now and it's adhered directly to the original paint surface. So without being overtly aggressive, which could damage the original paint, the safest option is to just retouch over the top of the barrier varnish, over the top of the overpaint, just so it's less noticeable. In an ideal world, you did have been able to remove that, but in this instance, it's, it's just not worth being aggressive, especially with such a delicate portrait and the way that certain elements have been rendered. 
So again, lots of tiny little dots and marks just to push those back and match the original tones. So always slowly, slowly at this stage, as my brush leaves the paints in, I'll be mixing the next colour, doing a small little test just to make sure it's the right tone. And then my eye kind of wanders a little bit. Sometimes if I've mixed a certain colour, I'll look elsewhere on the portrait and see where else that colour tone could sit or could lay. But here we've got lots of cool tones. In that shadow area we've got cool blues and crimsons coming through. So my palette will reflect that and make sure that I'm just bringing those tones in to keep that coolness to the portrait, especially under his eye and in his eye socket. And his horizontal lines I don't know whether this maybe this painting was rolled at some point or taken off its stretcher it was very loose on the stretcher when it arrived so horizontal cracks like this usually indicate some kind of rolling or bad transportation maybe it's not torn it's not ripped But the other little marks you can see the black dots are where it's been over cleaned in the past and they're the, the ridges or the tops of the canvas weave so as you're cleaning if you're not careful or if you're a little bit too aggressive that friction can take off the paint surface and reveal the original canvas weave underneath so when the majority of the retouching is done um, i will be then applying the final coats of varnish sometimes there might be two or three coats that go on as it dries you might see another little area that requires a little bit of your attention so you might have to do a little bit more retouching um, but invariably once this coat starts going on you know that you're almost complete and here he is in all his glory so strip lined repaired cleaned retouched revarnished um, and looking much better for it i love that sash it's so so vibrant but yeah he looks really good um this is how he arrived so damaged from transit very dirty very poor condition um, we wanted to save the inscription on the back so we've strip lined him and cleaned him and tried to keep him as original as possible and he looks fabulous lots cleaner a lot brighter now whether he is the comte de gramont or whether he is Antoine Hamilton, I'm not too sure. I know what I think. I'm not sure if my client would agree though. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Well, if you've made it this far through the video, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, as mentioned, I've loved uh, learning about the uh, Count de Gramont. Um, the book is here. Um, it is is quite hard going. Uh, I found some passages quite difficult to get through, but if you want to know what Charles II's restoration court was all about, uh, give it a read. If you want to find out more about the Count de Gramont and his character and some of his escapades, give it a go. It, it, it is fun. There are elements in there that are really funny. Um, <clears throat> As ever, thank you to my patrons. Thanks for all the support. Um, it means a hell of a lot. Um, thank you to all my new um, subscribers. Welcome along. And um, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I've not said that for ages. I don't know if it makes any difference at all. But I'm trying to grow the channel. I'm trying to get us up to 20,000. We're at about 13 and a half now. So it would be great to keep those numbers growing. Um, I've got a great video coming up for you soon. All you peely, sticky, um, scrape it kind of lovers will really get a kick out of it. So a uh, new video coming soon. Um, and yeah, thanks for watching. Nice sunny evening today. I'm going to go walk home via the canal and um, yeah, just chill out. So thanks for watching and I will catch you on the next one. Okay, take care guys. See you all soon.